All right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get started here. I guess I should I should address that. I don't want anybody falling asleep too much. Um, and these lights are not always the easiest to understand. There's two switches; they don't always talk to each other. So sometimes it's easier said than done. I'm really more of a half light sort of guy anyway, so you can, you can do that. I can keep you from falling asleep and be able to see what you're writing without it looking like that. Nobody needs that kind of light right now. It's quite not outside. Is that a sample? Right, exactly. Maybe a little more than that, though. Easier said than done. This is all weird delay. They just got me frozen. Well, I'm not going to this anyway. All right, we're going with this. All right, so we're going to keep working with conversions and sig fix. Um, and some of the stuff we're going to talk about today will seem will be familiar for those of you who went to lab on Monday. Um, and then for those of you who have lab today, you're going to get into lab and be like, oh, this is exactly what we we're just talking about in class. And so your lab will go a little bit smoother, um, but you might feel a little bit lost at first. Um, just remember that you're going to see it again in a few hours. Um, Couple more. I finished up looking at the intro quizzes. Those of you who are on the waitlist, um, I think I got everybody added from the waitlist. Um, so you should if you either get an email about, I don't know how they handle it, if you still have to go pay for um, or anything like that, but everybody should be able to get access to the Canvas shell by the end of today. Um, so if you can't, if you haven't heard um, from, from enrollment services or something, let me know and we'll get that all sorted. Um, but until the waitlisted students start um, filling in, this is the last of the, the quiz questions. Um, somebody asked me a very broad question. What does education mean? Is it something I wanted to do or that I was influenced to do? Um, a little bit of both. I, you know, I just like learning things. I like talking about, I, you know, I basically the way I, I do hobbies is I find something to obsess about for a couple months or a year. And, then I either transition into something else from there, or I just keep going more and more to totally switch tracks. Um, so I, I just like learning in general. I'd be doing that anyway, so I might as well be doing that. I thought when I was 18, I might as well be doing that in a, in a place where I get college credit for it, and it, you know, learning some useful skills. Um, and then I decided to go to grad school just because I had had some hard classes, but I hadn't hit a wall where I thought that I couldn't do the work. Um, so I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe I should go to grad school and see if I hit if I hit a class where I can't keep up anymore. Um, and grad school, I I found my limit. It turns out it wasn't in the coursework; it was in the research side. Um, you it takes a very very specific type of person to do well in academic research, and I'm not that type of person. Um, so, but it was just sort of a a thing that I just. Um, decided to try out. The nice thing about grad schools is if you're not going to one of the big grad schools, see, I'm going to phrase this. If you're not going to one of the grad schools that makes you money as a career, so like um, med school, law school, stuff like that, um, most PhD programs actually pay you to go to grad school. Um, they pay your tuition, you get a small stipend, which comes out to be well under minimum wage, but it's enough to live on usually. Um, I mean, close to livable wage anyway. Um, and so I figured, why not? I can be poor for a couple more years while I decide whether or not this works for me. Um, so that, that was kind of, it was kind of fun too. It's uh, it's an interesting challenge, you know, when you're in your twenties, if you don't have a whole lot, you know, if you don't have to deal with um, having kids or family and things like that, like, just how cheap can I be? How long can I live on, on this $1.50 worth of ramen that I bought from Grocery Outlet? Um, it gets old fast though. So, um, 
but yeah, in general, I, I really like education just because I like to learn myself, but it's also, I understand it's also a gateway to a, a lot of cool careers and sort of setting yourself apart from, from um, people who don't have degrees. So it's also a means to an end. So I kind of approach it from both, from both aspects. Um, and hopefully by the time you're done, you like learning for the sake of learning too, because that sticks with you. Um, you do not need to bring computers to class or lab. It might be helpful if you like taking notes on computers or if you have a hard time reading my slides from, from wherever you're sitting. It might be helpful to have your laptop up if you're scrolling through the slides like that um, while we're going, but it's totally not necessary. And like I, I might have only mentioned this to one of the lab sections, um, but we do have six Windows laptops in the lab that are community use. So if, if we do a lab where we're taking a lot of data or we're going to be doing some analysis in Excel, which there will be some of those, um, if you don't have a computer with you, there are computers that can be used. Um, and I'll try to give you advance notice so that those of you who do have you know, computers that are easy to, to bring with you um, know to bring your computers on those days. But it's absolutely not um, required in any way. We'll, make, we'll find ways to make it work if you don't have access to a, a laptop. Um, are we allowed to use our notes in the quizzes? Absolutely. Quizzes are open book, open note, uh, open any resource you want, really, um, short of just throwing them on Chegg and waiting for somebody else to answer for you. Um, everything short of that is fair game. And I will generally, with quizzes that have right and wrong answers, will go over the answers in class on Tuesday. So you'll turn your quiz in Sunday night. Um, on, and then on two, or sorry, not Tuesday, Monday, um, right now, basically, we would be going over, you know, where did people get hung up? What are the common pitfalls? What was the right answer? Um, I don't have it set to automatically give you the answers in most cases because chemistry doesn't lend itself to those sort of questions. The way that it goes writing these quiz questions, it works best with sort of fill in the blank answers. And it's really hard to um, provide feedback immediately with those sort of questions, the way Canvas works. And so typically it'll be a, you kind of have to wait uh, a little bit, you know, till Monday afternoon, and then we'll go over and see which, what you got. And, you know, and I do give partial credit on these quizzes as well. And so it might show up as a, if, if I do have some auto graded stuff, it might show up as you got a four out of 10, but that's because I haven't gone through and given partial credit for the one that you missed and given any credit for the ones that are, that are graded by hand. So don't get, don't freak out. I always get a ton of emails. It'll be you know, next Monday morning. So right after everybody submits their first like quiz, quiz, um, there's a, I freaks out. I got three out of three out of 10 on this one. Well, yeah, because I haven't given you those four points and given you partial credit for those two. So it, you know, it, don't worry about that. Don't send me panicked emails. I mean, if you're really panicked, of course, send me an email, but just know that I do go back through, look at all of them Monday morning, give partial credit, um, and then we'll, we'll go over the right answers in class on that Monday. So uh, again, don't panic. Um, and then I don't usually do a cheat sheet on the final. Um, typically because you're going to have those three pages of the periodic table, equation sheet, conversion sheet, um, that are basically everything you really need. Um, so I don't usually do cheat sheets. Uh, if you, if you have a compelling argument for why we do need to have cheat sheets on these quizzes or on these, um, on the final exam, I'm willing to hear it. Um, but probably wait till we get a little bit closer. So you know how to make that argument based on what the resources are you have and what is on the, the test itself. Um, there will be a portion of the final that is take home test, which is like the quizzes, open book, open note. You can work with other people in the class, even everything short of throw it up on Chegg. Um, but we'll talk about the rules for that when we get closer. So there will be a part of it, the stuff that's you know tricky word problems or problem solving stuff will be open note, open book, I'll have a whole week to finish it and submit it. And then the stuff that's in class, closed note will be very, um, it's a, 
I won't say it's a short test, but it's very cut and dry. These are the skills you need going into it. So it's not a, a test where having a cheat sheet really would be all that helpful anyway. You either know the skills or you don't um, for that part. But again, feel free to try and convince me. I like saying yes when students make requests, but you have to convince me that it's, that it's necessary and gonna be helpful um, and that you will still be able to learn the material and not just rely on the cheat sheet. Other random chemistry stuff. Um, somebody asked, what are some chemistry fun facts? Um, did you know that you, the only reason that you can ice skate is because ice is less dense than water. The reason you need ice skate, you need to um, blades to skate on, and why sharper ice skates work better than dull ice skates, is because you're taking your whole body weight and you're putting it on a very, very small amount of area of ice, which, which exerts a huge amount of pressure on that one little strip of ice. You put enough pressure on it and it goes to its most compact form, which is liquid. So when you actually are, when you're ice skating, you're actually gliding on liquid on top of the solid ice, and then it refreezes when you remove the pressure. Um, so even if you're not like scraping the ice, if you have a really, really fresh sheet of ice and you skate across it, you can see when somebody does that, even if they're not making any scraping motion or anything like that, because you can see where it melted and refroze, um, which I think is a pretty fun chemistry fact. Um, the physicists would try to claim that that's really physics, not chemistry, but it's applied physics, so it's really chemistry. That's all, that's all chemistry is, is applied physics. Um, you know, basically physics without the assumptions, without saying things like, assume zero air resistance. Um, other exciting topics, well, exciting might be overselling it, but um, phase change in general is generally something people think is pretty cool. We start talking, we get to talk about like the energy of what happens when um, water condenses on the outside of a can. You know, why is that, why does that warm things up? Turns out you don't actually need a, a uh, drink koozie. They're not all beer koozies, just most of them. Um, you don't need a drink koozie just for, because it's warm outside or for, to protect the drink from your hands heat. It's actually to prevent condensation on the outside of it because the condensation, it only takes something like five grams of water to bring a can of soda from, um, from ice cold to room temperature. And five grams of water is really not that much. If you're in Midwest in the summer, that's you know your first four minutes of having a, a can sit out. You've got five grams of condensation in your drinks room temperature. Um, so stuff like that, you know, more the most stuff we can do um, that's kind of applied that way for whatever reason, phase change is one of the first big topics that we talk about that people are, are interested in. Plus, it's also why um, you can't bake or cook very well up at altitude without making some adjustments. Our water doesn't boil at the same temperature. Um, and that has to do with our atmospheric pressure. So stuff like that's kind of fun applications. It's reason why rice takes longer to cook. If you've ever used a rice cooker at altitude, they always boil over. Um, and that's because our water doesn't boil at the same temperature as sea level. Um, other just random links, some fun YouTube channels. Um, this guy's really funny. He has, he has really good, he's very excited. Um, which is, is all you really want from somebody who's doing random science in their backyard, right? Um, does stuff like melt, melt uh, salt and pour it into water. And it turns out that releases so much energy so quickly. Uh, he was able that a little crucible like this of melted salt um, kind of blew up um, to the extent that it shattered a 10 gallon fish tank. Um, you know, Cool stuff like that. And he does it at super high speed camera, you know, ultra resolution. Um, so he's, you know, some of these are a lot, are really fun. Um, I will actually link to some specific examples of Professor Dave explains for relevant things. Um, he's really, really cool. Um, really good at uh, doing, at explaining things with good production value for some of his diagrams and stuff. Um, and then if you need, if you get tired of YouTube's recommended, you know, chill lo-fi beats to study to, um, then you can also put on like things like the jellyfish cam from Monterey Bay. Um, 
this is kind of fun to have on in the background while you're studying. You know, you can just take a minute, take a deep breath, and then go back to stressing out about your chemistry. <laughs> Uh, and then this this one is just a, a guy who's uh, really good at chemistry from the UK who um, who's also good at graphic design, um, who does you know explains a lot of the chemistry behind everyday stuff and does it and makes some pretty cool posters. Um, so looking at you know crocuses, saffron, and things that look like that but are poisonous and why. Um, so if you're interested in applications of chemistry. Uh, this is a pretty good, fun place to poke around. You've got analytical chemistry, forensic chemistry, chemical warfare categories. I'm not sure why it's so zoomed in like that. But um, good place to spend some time if you're, if you're like, well, I don't know what part of chemistry is actually interesting to me. It's a good place to see um, stuff that touches on things you are interested in. All right, let's do some practice conversions. I think all the qualities that you need are at the bottom down here. But if there's anything missing, let me know. Let's just do some practice. And, you know, if it's a really easy one for you, don't necessarily need to do this. I'm not collecting this, but practice showing your work. And we'll go through some of these. Bless you. All right, apologies again that I can't manage to line up my writing um, all that well with this thing right now. Um, but for starters, you wanna go centimeters to millimeters. There's always a way that you can combine these prefixes in a way that you can go from any one prefix, to any other prefix in a single step, but it involves simplifying exponents in a fraction um, and that's an, that's an easy place to miss a decimal place when you're when you're doing that. Um, so you could combine these and say, okay, well, I know that there's a hundred centimeters in a millimeter or in a meter, and I know there's a thousand millimeters in a meter. Therefore, I could write a conversion that says, um, you know, that there's ten millimeters equals one centimeter. You could do that and use this equality and do this in one step. But simplifying these into one combined equality is an easy place to mess up. 
So what I always recommend, especially as you're getting used to this, is anytime you need to go from one prefix to a different prefix, take it to the base unit. In the case of centimeters to millimeters, take it to meters and then go meters to millimeters. Because that, that means that you're, you can just use the multipliers that are on your equation sheet. You don't need to do any simplifying um, powers of 10 in your head. Um, again, if you're comfortable with that, you can always do that. I would just double check that you wrote down something that's reasonable and know that that's a place that you need to be careful. So in this case, the net result is we multiply by 10, right? We divide by 100, then multiply by 1,000. So our final answer would be, not centimeters, millimeters now. And we're gonna keep three sig figs. Because what do we know about those prefix conversions? Do they have sig figs? I, we don't, sorry, that's a bad way of phrasing that. We don't need to worry about the sig figs because they have all of the sig figs. They have infinite sig figs, they're exact, right? So we, um, we are only worried about the sig figs that we started with if we're using exact conversions. Millimeters to centimeters is just going back the other way, right? To go millimeters to meters and then meters to centimeters. There is one way that you can easily combine some of these prefixes is anytime you can say that two things are equal to each other or equal to the same thing, you can say that they're equal to each other as well, right? So you could say, okay, well, 10 to the two centimeters, 100 centimeters is one meter and 10 to the three millimeters is equal to one meter. Therefore, 100 centimeters is equal to 1,000 millimeters, right? See, see, see how they're both equal to one meter? So then you could rewrite your equality to look like that. So essentially you're just combining those two things since they're the same. Again, and if none of that makes sense or that seems like it's more complicated than just doing a little bit of extra writing, just do the little bit of extra writing. It's never gonna steer you wrong. You don't have to be able to do all these simplification steps. You just have to be willing to write more if you're not gonna do them. So what are we gonna get for 52.4 millimeters to centimeters? Net result is divide by 10. So 5.24 centimeters. And again, I know you probably know how to do that conversion in your head. Practice showing the work for it so that you don't wind up um, not being comfortable when you get to the trickier ones. 1.0 miles to inches. What are the two steps we need to do to go miles to inches? Miles to feet. We've got a good conversion for miles to feet. And then we know the conversion for feet to inches, right? So when in doubt, leverage what you already know. Sometimes it means taking more steps, but if it means I don't have, I can get by only memorizing a few conversions instead of memorizing every conversion, that's, that's usually helpful. The 1.0 miles, we wanna can cancel out miles and be left in feet. So we put one mile on bottom, we look at our conversion sheet to remind ourselves that it's 
5,280 feet in one mile. We could hit enter on our calculator and get a number in feet or, well, that would be really simple to do, right? Um, or we can go one more step and say, well, one foot is 12 inches. So mile cancels mile, feet cancels feet. We're left in inches. You get something like 60,000 inches, right? 5.3? What do we get? What's 5,280 times 12? 63,000. 360. And cannot get used to that. So we're only going to keep two sig figs. So 6.3 times 10 to the four inches. Now, only two sig figs because our starting number 1.0 miles only has two sig figs. Let's do something a little more interesting. Is there anything tricky about going kilograms to milligrams? Not really, as long as you don't mix up and multiply by a thousand when you were supposed to divide by a thousand. So again, let's show our work. At the very least, 45 kilograms is kind of heavy, right? 45 kilograms is in the same ballpark as hundred pounds. In other words, it should be a lot of milligrams. So when we do this, you should wind up with an answer that's a big number. If you don't, you did something wrong somewhere, right? So have that internal reasonable check. Does my answer match up at least a little bit with what I was expecting? If not, make sure that what you actually typed into your calculator matches what you wrote down and that what you wrote down makes sense. So 45.01 kilograms. A kilogram is bigger than a gram. So one kilogram is a thousand grams. And I'm gonna kind of go sideways here to go around the writing. Then we need to go to milligrams. Milli is another thousand conversion, right? And it's milligram is smaller than a gram. So we know that one gram is a lot of milligrams. So we should wind up with 4.501 times 10 to the seven milligrams when you plug that in. In other words, 45 million milligrams. Um, a quick note about your calculators when you start getting into scientific notation range on your calculator. If you get a big long repeating conversion or a repeating decimal, don't forget to look at the end to see whether or not it has um, scientific notation attached to it. Because a calculator that reports something, that's not my tab at all, but it'll do. Um, so we want to say 4.5 times 10 to the seven would be one way of writing our 4.501, put the 01 in there. So this is one way of typing that in, is just type in times 10, use caret for the exponent, and you get a number. Um, if we get to really big numbers, Google will return a number in scientific notation, but it does it in shorthand. This E, and if I'm being really picky, that E should be a capital E, is short for times 10 to the. So 4.501 E plus 17, 
means 4.501 times 10 to the 17th, right? So, and if you've got a Texas Instruments calculator, when you plug this into your calculator, um, it might, you might get this long repeating decimal that has E and then a number at the end. Same thing, don't forget to look to see if your answer is in scientific notation with some of these, especially when we get into really large numbers. Because if you did, if you plug something into your calculator and you got, you know, if you were expecting a really big number and you got four point, uh, and you got something that looks like it's close to one, it's probably because you missed scientific notation in there somewhere. So watch out for that. Um, and most calculators have a way of plugging, uh, using that shorthand for scientific notation. Um, if you plug in, 4.501 E17. Okay, well, that didn't work well. Um, maybe they've changed their, maybe it needs the plus now. No, I guess they're not using that in Google anymore. Um, well, Wolfram Alpha will still do it. So we'll switch there. Well, that's good to know. Um, so if you're doing scientific notation in Google as your calculator, you do have to input it by hand, but if you plug it into Wolfram Alpha, it takes that E and turns it into scientific notation for you. So you do have that shorthand. If you're using a Texas Instruments calculator, um, there's a capital E. It's usually you have to hit the second button. It's in the yellow writing. Um, right above the number pad for most versions. It's in usually it's EE -E is what it says. And that's your, your cue to say that you're writing something in scientific notation. Milligrams to grams, seconds to hours. If you have your conversion sheet with you, you might notice that there's already a conversion that goes directly seconds to hours. So you could do it in one step. If you don't have that sheet or don't remember that conversion, everybody still knows how many seconds are in a minute, right? And if you know how many seconds are in a minute and you know how many minutes are in an hour, 60 times 60. Right? So you don't have to have your conversion sheet if you can get to the right conversions with stuff you already have memorized. So 34.87 seconds. And for every 60 seconds, it's one minute. And every 60 minutes is one hour. So we'll wind up with something that's 0 0.009. 0 0.009. And how many sig figs are we going to want to write down? Four. So zero, zero, 009, give me three more sig figs. Six, eight. All right, so remember, those are not sig figs. So if we want four sig figs, we need four numbers starting with the nine. Uh, close. We're moving the decimal three places, right? Yeah. Which is why that's the thousandth place. It always seemed weird to me when I was a kid that well, it's only, there's only two zeros in front of it and a thousand has three zeros after it. So why is it the thousandth place? Because it's three decimal places over, just like a thousand is three decimal places in the other direction. If you're in weird, unfamiliar units, does anything really change about the process? No? So just because you don't happen to have the 
the conversion for cubic inches to gallons memorized, as long as you can recognize that they're both volumes, or even if they're not both volumes, as long as you can find an equality that says how many cubic inches is one gallon, your process is the same. We want to cancel out cubic inches and be left in gallons. Does anybody know where 231 cubic inches, does anybody know where a gallon comes from? This is an honest question, I, not a leading question. I actually don't remember that one. I know some of them, but I don't remember that one. It's just a really weird number that arbitrarily was decided this is a gallon. It's exactly 231 cubic inches because nothing can ever be easy in British units. Set it up, inches cubed on bottom to cancel out, gallon on top. We'll get something a little over two. And we would want to write down how many sig figs? Four. Bingo. The 231 is exact. It's a weird number, but it's an exact number because it's a conversion within the same units, within, within British units. All right, questions on these? Everybody feeling okay-ish with, uh, with straightforward conversions? As long as it's on your conversion sheet, right? And it's a length to a length, there's nothing really tricky about it, right? One that I always remember is the, an acre. An acre is 5,000 or 43,000. Go for it. Um, an acre is 43,460 square feet, something like that, um, which originally was the, the area of land that a single person could plow um, by themselves in a day. So you were expected to, when you were, if you were a, a surfer, a peon in medieval times, you were expected to be able to work that one acre of land, farmland in a day. Um, that's where that came from. Now we have remote controlled combines that can do 100,000 acres in a day, something like that. Um, but that's where it originated at some point. I don't know why they didn't pick more friendly numbers though. Everybody knows where zero Celsius and 100 Celsius come from. So zero Celsius is the melting point of water, um, where ice and water, where ice melts or water freezes. 100 Celsius is where it boils. Does anybody know where 100 Fahrenheit or zero Fahrenheit comes from? What's that? Uh, I don't think so. It's, that's not the story I'd heard, though. It could be. Um, Zero Fahrenheit was basically the temperature that Lord Fahrenheit, the coldest temperature he could make with water and salt and ice. Um, so it didn't actually have any significance. He said, well, it doesn't get any colder than this, so we'll call it zero. Um, and then 100, I believe, was the story I heard was that it was the body temperature of a cow um, is 100 Fahrenheit. And he was a, a Lord in, I mean, Renaissance times, but still, you know, um, was definitely in a feudal system. So body temperature of a cow was more significant to him than the body temperature of a person, I guess. Anyway, um, there's a reason we're not going to use Fahrenheit very much because it doesn't make any sense. All right, when we are talking about converting um, between British units and metric units, um, we basically are always going to come to the same point. It's not, there we go. Basically, the only two conversions I want you to use reliably between US and metric units is 2.54 centimeters equals one inch, because that's exact. That's the only exact conversion between British and metric units. Um, 
basically it used to be an approximate conversion and then but it was so close to the right number it was like 2.54001 centimeters was the one inch that they just redefined an inch actually in the 90s i want to say maybe 80s they just said well it's close enough and it's really helpful to have an exact conversion instead of a sig fig based conversion so we're just going to say one inch is now exactly defined as 2.54 centimeters um other than that there is no exact conversion the only other conversion that really is reliably used is grams to pounds I mean, even that's measured that's not exact so essentially if you're converting a distance in imperial units and into metric units you have to get to inches or centimeters and then go all the way back up the other side there are some approximate conversions um, on your equation sheet even, but you have to watch out for the, the sig figs for those. If you want five sig figs and you only have your equation, she only has, I believe the equation she has um, 1. 1.609, right? I cannot find that. 1.609 kilometers equals one mile that 1.609 is a measured number so if you want five sig figs you can't use that because if you use this you would have to round to four sig figs so you have to go look up an even better conversion or just convert whatever you're doing down to inches or centimeters and then go the other way yeah it's more steps writing wise it's actually fewer things to memorize it means you only really need to memorize this and how to get to miles from inches, and then how to use the prefixes, right? That way you don't need to worry about, I can't remember, was it 1.609 or 1.608? It's 1.6 something, right? 2.54 is the only one you really need. But it does mean that sometimes if you're going kilometers to miles, kilometers, down to centimeters, centimeters to inches, inches to miles. And I'm. this is another one of those, I'm telling you right now, it will be on the final. I'm going to make you do a long conversion on the final, just to show me you can, right? I won't make you do it all the time because it is a lot of writing for no reason when there's an almost as good conversion right there next to it. But I want you to know it's more about the process than it is going from miles to kilometers. This is just a really convenient one to, to demonstrate that. So if we want the distance of a 10K, let's say your 10K is accurate down to the meter. So you wanna keep five sig figs and you wanna know how many miles that is with five sig figs. Try and practice drawing out that really long one. If you get to, the, if you run out of space on one line, you can either do what I do, which is, you know, if I get to the end and I'm not done yet, you can give one of those and start on another line. Say I kept going, or hit enter on your calculator, write down the number, and start wherever you stopped and keep going. Give that a try, and then we'll work through it in a second.
it's a lot of writing for something that you can get an almost as good answer with a single step conversion. But again, it's about practicing the process here. So one kilometer is a thousand meters. Again, make sure you don't divide where you're supposed to multiply. So double check your logic with these prefixes. The meter is smaller than a kilometer. Therefore, there's a lot of meters equals one kilometer. One meter is hundred centimeters. The centimeters to inches is the one where, where people do tend to switch the numbers. They'll say 2.54 inches equals one centimeter. Again, remember which one is bigger. An inch is bigger than a centimeter. I think we all have enough experience with centimeters and inches to know that, right? Am I the only one who spent like all of fourth grade just like staring at a ruler because it was more interesting than the teacher? Um, like I got to know my ruler really well. It's like 30 some odd centimeters in, in, in a 12 inch ruler. Um, so make sure that you're writing down your numbers properly. And again, now we're in inches. We want inches on bottom to cancel that out. 12 inches in a foot, 5,280 feet in a mile. You see also how it would be really easy on some of these longer conversions to think you know the process in your head, but, eat, but wind up multiplying by 12 when you were supposed to divide by 12 because you didn't want to show your work. The ones you think you can do in your head, double check that you're not flipping the, the top and the bottom of your fraction. Make everything cancel out right. And we get a number that is what six point, wow, it was six point what? Good. Again, not inherently that tricky. The math is pretty straightforward. If you're, and if you're plugging this into your calculator, the fastest way I would plug this into, into a calculator would be, no, not that one. Ten <clears throat> times. 1,000 times 100 over 2.54 over 12 over 5,280 would be the way that I would plug it into a calculator. Except I'm off by multiple. I did. I made that. No, I did that right. What's wrong here? Yep, that's it. Reasonableness check, right? I know that 10 kilometers is not 6,000 miles. That makes running a 10K a lot more impressive. But just as far as the way that you could enter it into your calculator, it's on the bottom, you divide by it. It's on the top, you multiply by it, and just go left to right. All right, questions on this one. Cool. Again, I told you I'm pretty fast at that. Um, I'll say it again, questions on this one? Anything I did that doesn't make sense? Awesome, I'm happy to hear that. So everybody will 100% get every conversion problem right for the rest of this class, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't even get my own example right. Hopefully you at least know when you get them wrong, even if you can't find your error on the, in a time situation. I, I, I actually am more generous with partial credit when somebody writes something like 6,000 can't be right, but I can't find my mistake. You know, so you still box the answer you know is wrong, but you wrote a note that says, I know this is wrong, but I just don't know why. That's fine. I can be more generous then because it shows me you did that reasonableness check that you know that there's something wrong. Matt? So when you started that, you did 10 to the third degree conversion. 
more tangible. You're essentially just breaking that back down to the base of what you said, and from there, it's like it's easier to convert that back to the tangible and tangible. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that's where the scale on the conversion sheet helps, because that just tells you what column the thing might come to to convert it. Right. Exactly. So you don't need to remember that what the multiplier is for mega, as long as you know that mega is one of those ones that makes it bigger and you can find it on your sheet, right? Because then you can say, okay, oh, mega is 10 to the six. And I know, so that means that there's a lot of mega meters in, or a lot of meters in one mega meter. Right? So that, you know, just knowing makes things bigger or smaller and knowing where to find it on your equation sheet is the is the easiest way to get get your a handle on using those like i guess that i don't even have them all memorized i just know the general order and can kind of figure it out from there i'm zoomed in all the way that's what's wrong part way all right before we take a break i want to talk about one new concept um, because, and then we're going to come back and work at it. So I want you to hear it twice. When we're dealing with higher powers of units, by which I mean anything where you've got a squared unit or a cubed unit, anytime where your unit is to a power other than one, that makes our conversions a little trickier, but it doesn't mean our rules don't work. So if you think about converting, if you look at what a square centimeter is, obviously these are not to scale. If you have a square centimeter, that's a box, a two dimensional box that is a centimeter on each side, right? If you have a square inch, that's a box that's an inch on each side. If I wanted to convert the area of this square inches into the area in square centimeters, you have to convert both sides. Right? So we could take this and we can say, okay, well, two. You know, one inch is 2.54 centimeters and one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And now we have a box that's not one inch on each side. We have a box that's 2.54 centimeters by 2.54 centimeters, which makes sense, right? And then we can just find the area by saying 2.54 centimeters squared. We don't always have nice, neat rectangles though. We can't always just convert both sides of a box in order to get the area in different units. So when that's the case, we just treat the conversion like we have to do it twice. So remember, I keep coming back to, we can treat units like they're variables in math, right? And if you wanna, if you have X squared over X, you only get to cancel out one of those powers from the X squared, right? So if we wanna convert both powers of inches, effectively converting both sides of the box, we have to do the conversion twice. Because we need both of those. If this is inches squared is inches times inches, right? So if we just did the conversion once, we'd only be canceling out one of those. We'd be in units of inches times centimeters, which is technically an area unit. It's just not a convenient one. So you're essentially saying 2.5. Bingo. Remember that the way <laughs> they told you they were not going to do that during this class. Um, the way that exponents work is if we distribute this, if we distribute that square, it squares everything inside the parentheses. So we have to take to do this. It's two point five four squared centimeters squared one squared. Uh, into square. Because we really remember this is an equality, right? So the top is equal to the bottom, which means anything we do to the top, we can do to the bottom without changing. So we can square the top and bottom without changing. So 2.54 squared centimeters squared over one squared inches squared. That's the our new conversion factor. At least they're timing it from when I'm you know, moving from one side of the room to the other. Um, this is easier to write though. 
Just don't forget that you need to distribute that squared throughout the whole thing. You have to convert both sides. And if it makes more sense to you and you don't mind the extra writing, it's totally fine to just write out this conversion twice. Like that's basically what we're saying, right? We're converting one side of the box and then the other side of the box. And if, it, if we're doing this for a volume, if we're going cubic centimeters to cubic inches, we would just have to do it three times. You have to do it the length of the box, the width of the box, and the height of the box. And so it doesn't really change our process. This is just one new tool we can plug in there. So we don't actually need to memorize a different conversion for cubic centimeters to cubic inches. It's still this same conversion. If you have this one, you can do both of those. And this one's exact, which is kind of nice. So let's take a break there and we'll come back and we'll calculate the volume of that box in cubic inches. So let's come back in 10 minutes, let's come back at five after, call it six after.
Hey Chase, is uh, is the shell showing up for you now? Yes. Cool. No problem, glad we could get it worked out. All right, if you're back in here and you haven't given this a try yet on your own, see if you can figure out the volume in cubic inches. Then we'll I'll work through it in a minute. So again, apologies for the sloppy writing there. I think I'm just going to rewrite that by hand on the board. All 
All right, so really the, there are two ways you can answer this question. The simplest in terms of keeping things the same as, as what we've been working on would just be to take all three of the dimensions and convert them to inches before you plug it into the volume equation, right? If you took the time and you took 7.68 centimeters and you put that in inches, and you took 12.545 centimeters and put that in inches, and you put 5.56 centimeters into inches. Great, that works. And now you can just pay your, your volume in cubic inches that way, and you should get the same answer within six bits. That's three conversions. And it, that method falls apart if you don't have a convenient volume equation. Right, so those of you who had lab on Monday, part of the lab is finding the volume of irregularly shaped aluminum pellets, right? You can't convert the dimensions of an aluminum pellet into different units before you find the volume, right? You find the volume first and then you could convert. So sometimes there, there are some cases where it's easier to to convert the individual measurements first, and then that's going to solve some problems, some conversion problems down the line. But for the most part, knowing how to do this gets around having to worry about it. If you just if you have the volume in cubic centimeters, and you want it in cubic inches, and you know regular inches to regular centimeters, you just do this three times, and you can even plug it into your calculator that way. You get the right answer. You took 532 and you typed in divide by 2.54, divide by 2.54, divide by 2.54. You'll get the same answer as, as if you would divide by 2.54 to the third. So if you have, if you're using a calculator that doesn't have a convenient exponent function, or if you don't know how to get cubed on your calculator, one, let's fix that. Um, what I can work with you so we can figure out how you can use the calculator you have to do exponents because we're not always going to be dealing with things that have their own button like squared or cubed. Um, but you can get around it just by doing it by hand basically. Right? And then, so in this case, I think we come out with something like 36. point. Five inches cubed. Is that a reasonable number? You think about that's kind of a big number for cubic centimeters, right? And that's kind of a small number. We think of inches and centimeters as not being that different in size, right? But the fact that it's cubed, we're talking about volume, means the difference between it's an inch and a cubic centimeter, or an inch and a centimeter gets cubed as well. Right? So if you think about what 30 cubic inches might look like, if we call it 36 cubic inches, we can think about that as being a box that's six inches by six inches. That would be 36 square inches, right? And then one inch tall gets you 36 cubic inches. So a box, I don't know, about that big, that's one inch deep is about what we're talking about here. What's 500 cubic centimeters in terms of something that you could visualize? <laughs> That might help too, right? We know that one cubic centimeter is exactly the same as a milliliter. We're talking about half a liter, right? Think about what half a liter is. It's like a water bottle. Now, all of a sudden, that when you put it into context, a water bottle and our little six by six by one box, those are pretty close to the right dimensions, right? So it seems like there's a mismatch because of that cubed, but that doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Sometimes you just need to put volumes of, in particular are really hard to estimate um, before you do the conversion. So it takes some practice to be able to do that, to give yourself some context.
What about in gallons? How do we convert 32.5 inches cubed into gallons? Very tricky about that one. We've got a conversion for gallon cubic inches already, right? But this is just like any of the other conversions we've done. Two hundred thirty-one inches cubed equals one gallon. Do we need to worry about cubing that whole conversion? Why not? It's already cubed. The cubed is already part of the conversion in this case. Right, because that's 231 cubic inches. We don't need to do this again because then we get inches to the ninth, which doesn't make any sense, right? What what is it in on top we get cubic gallons? which I'm not just trying to emphasize that it wouldn't make sense. It's kind of interesting to think about what that, what would a cubic volume look like? Can you have a volume cubed, not in the physical space that we're used to? Um, if you ever get units that really don't make sense, and there's totally unfamiliar to you and you have no idea what happened, you may have flipped a conversion somewhere not cancel that where you were supposed to, or maybe you weren't supposed to cube that conversion that you cube somewhere in there. All right, so just pay attention to that. With these volumes and areas, sometimes you get a unit or a conversion that already has the square or already has the cube as part of it. All right, so questions on volumes and areas. Let's do, let's do one more that I will just make up on the fly here. Let's figure out how many acres this classroom is. How big is this classroom in terms of square footage? What's the, the distance from here to the back wall? Ballpark, we don't need to be that close. 25, I like that. 27, so we're very clearly in the same ballpark, right? Within the same, within sig figs, that's pretty close to the same number. Let's call it 25, because I like 25. That's a more convenient number to work with than 27. So we've got a box that is 25 feet and what's the width would you say? 40, 60. Um, my you know, my brain thinks in fractions, right? And I'm looking at this and saying that if we're calling this distance 25, this distance looks roughly double that. So, and to make it clear that it's two sig figs and not just one, and because I don't wanna write 50 in scientific notation, um, I'm just gonna say it's 52 feet. And we're trying to communicate with our friends in Europe that think in square meters, not in square feet. 
how big this room is. How many meters, sorry, not cubed, squared. It would be really hard to convert an area to cubic meters. And then just in the interest of practicing with other conversions, let's figure out how many acres this room would be. Four th forty three thousand five hundred and sixty is one acre. That's really hard to read for you. Do it again. First off, how do we do with our estimate of this, of the dimensions for this room? Is this room 1,300 square feet? Probably, we're probably over, I would say. Considering, you know, a four bedroom house is 1,600 square feet. I don't think that we have the same footprint here as a four bedroom house. So we probably overestimated probably on both of our dimensions, it's probably more like 20 by 20 by 40 instead of 25 by 50. But we're at least in the right ballpark. We'll call it good enough for now to two sig figs. If we wanna put that in square meters, we've gotta convert our feet to meters and we've gotta square every conversion along the way. The good news there is that we have those memorized probably, or at least close to. One point three times ten to the three feet squared. Once we're in inches squared, what are we gonna do? We're trying to get to square meters, centimeters, right? And again, the conversion does not change. We just have to do it twice.
and then we can go centimeters to meters twice. So we'll get Hundred and twenty, hundred and twenty one, hundred and twenty, since we're only going to keep two sig figs. So, really, the only thing tricky about using these higher powers of units is you just have to remember to do this and remember to plug it in when you actually do this. Probably the I think I see more mistakes just in using your calculator incorrectly with these than actually setting it up wrong. Because it's really easy, especially when it's just one of your conversion factors in the middle is squared. Um, it's really easy to just forget to hit that squared button when you're plugging it into your calculator. And you'll get a number that doesn't make sense and you can't tell why, because everything looks right on your paper. So. When I see mistakes like that, where it looks, I don't see anything wrong with what you, with the work that you showed, but your answer is wrong. I will just usually write calculator error. And that's, you know, a, a one point deduction or something like that. It's not out of a 10 point question. If you set everything up right on a question and just plug it into your calculator wrong, that's a nine out of 10. Gus? What does it say on the, uh, oh, sorry, meters squared? If we want it in acres, we don't have to go through all that hassle because we are in square feet and we already have a conversion for one acre equals 43,560 square feet. So in that case, one point three ten to the three feet squared and four three five six zero feet squared is one acre. Again, I don't know why they didn't pick a nicer number, but I'm sure there's some random field in England that is the definition of an acre that is 43,560 square feet um, or something like that. So we'll get something, should be pretty small, right? 1,000 divided by 40,000, one over 40. We're talking about like one, maybe 1.5%, 0.01. 0.02 somewhere in there. What do we get? Nine eight. So to keep it to two sig figs, we'd have to round the eight up to round the nine up. So we'd wind up with zero point zero three zero acres. So that was our calculator answer. Only two sig figs because our 1.3 only has two sig figs. And it might not look like it, but 43,560 is an exact number. It's exactly a pain to deal with. We don't deal with acres very much because why? All right. So 20 minutes left. Let's talk about where converting units actually gets useful. Being able to convert square feet to acres is great and all, um, but that's just scratching the surface of how useful the skill is. And so when you, 
when you start doing things beyond just converting units, it's what a lot of textbooks call dimensional analysis. Um, because it's not limited to just converting in the same variables. So just because you started with a distance doesn't mean it has to stay as a distance. If you pay attention to your units, you can convert a distance into any number of things. Um, let's say that, uh, let's say I'm trying to dig a trench to run irrigation in my backyard or something. I need to, I need to dig 250 feet of trench and each foot costs me $5. I can convert a distance in terms of 250 feet into a dollar amount by using that, right? By making the units cancel out. Any two things you can say are equal may, will fit in there. And so the, the simplest one, the most obvious one is speed. If you wanna convert a distance into a time, you need a speed. Or if you want to convert a time into a distance, you need a speed. But you can also convert the pieces of it as well. But if, if I have a number in 22.0 meters per second, and I want to know what that is in miles per hour, it's just some conversions. There's a couple ways you can do this. One of the ways is to remember that that fraction, that 22 meters per second, what does per mean? For each one, right? for each one, meaning we could say 22 meters over one second. It means we have a distance and we have a time. We can convert them both separately if we want. So that means we can write things like, okay, well, I'm gonna convert 22.0 meters into kilometers. And I'm gonna take one second and convert it into hours. And then just take your two numbers at the end and put kilometers over hours and do the math. We're going to one second into hours is going to be a really small number, right? So one second, 60 seconds is one minute, 60 minutes is one hour. So one over 3,600 is going to give us something like 0 0.001, 0 0 0.0009. What do we get? That's a little bit more than a third than 33. So yeah, I don't know, eight, six. Usually this is the fastest way to get people to speak up and give me the answers when I start writing numbers that are wrong on the board. So somebody correct me and tell me where I'm wrong. Yeah, 0.002, 0.0002. Okay, and how many sig figs are we gonna wanna write <clears throat> out for this one? Three. Our this number doesn't really have any sig figs associated with it, but we have three sig figs there. Basically, we're going to assume this is an exact number because that's our measured number. When you say miles per hour, you're assuming that when you're talking about an hour, that's an exact hour, and your and your distance is approximate. Whatever's on the bottom of the combined units, just call it exactly one. But we just want to write out as many sig figs as we have on the top in this case. So 0 0.002, 77, 78. Bingo. Should be three zeros. Good. If I want to take meters into kilometers, that's also pretty straightforward, right? 22.0 meters and a thousand meters is one kilometer. So 0 0.0220 kilometers, right? 22 over a thousand. 
Well, so we just converted the amount that's on the top, and then we converted the amount that's on the bottom. If we want, if this is the distance traveled in this amount of time, we just take kilometers and we divide by hours. So 0 0.0220 kilometers over 0 0.000. 278 hours, we get something like 10, a little bit less than 10. Okay. 79. Okay. So I, I slipped a digit somewhere. Oh, yeah, because there's three zeros and only one there. Yeah, something close to 100 is what I meant to say. So, and how many sig figs are we going to want to keep? Three, right? So 79.1 kilometers per hour. So converting speeds, converting any combined unit is just as easy as converting the pieces of it. And then you just add one division step at the end. If you have a density that is in grams per cubic centimeter and you want to know what that is in pounds per gallon, you take cubic centimeter, you convert to gallons. You take grams, you convert to pounds, and then do the division. And again, this way will never fail you, but there's a way we can do the, all of this in one line on your binder paper. If we just Remember that all we're really doing to convert units is multiplying by one, right? We're in the habit of putting the unit that we want to cancel out on the bottom of our conversion factor, right? Because it's on the top of the number we're starting with. There's no reason why we can't convert the units on the bottom of what we're starting with. Say 22.0 meters over one second. If we leave it combined like this, we can still cancel out seconds with another conversion factor, right? So you can still say 3,600 seconds is one hour. It's backwards from what we've been doing, but it follows all our rules. We're still multiplying by one. We're just canceling out that, the bottom unit. That we started with instead of canceling out the copy that we started with. So just by doing this, we get two meters per hour. If we want to then take meters and convert meters to kilometers, we can back that one on too. A thousand meters is one kilometer. Just because they're not right next to each other doesn't mean that units on top and bottom won't cancel out, right? Meters cancel meters. Mathematically, we'll get the exact same number if we do it this way as this way. We just had to do it more steps. We do more rounding if we set it up like this. This approach, taking the top and converting it and then taking the bottom and converting it, will never let you down. There's just a faster way, too. If that's tricky for you, but this made sense, use this way or vice versa. What I did over here makes no sense. You can follow the process for over there. Do it that way. I don't care how you show your work, as long as you know what you're doing and you can convince me you know what you're doing and you get the right answer. Oops. And that's showing the work here. So we can also do converting miles per hour into feet per second. Same thing, right? We can also set up longer conversions to do something like converting the price of gas. Now, this is outdated. We're almost double that now, right? I just, you know, I just you know, lock my eyes when I walk up to the gas pump and I wave a card at it and pretend like I don't. Don't realize how much it's costing me. Any of these still work. Prices are conversions. It's usually dollar amount or a currency amount per unit. 
per gallon in the case of gasoline. But we, so we could convert US dollars per gallon into euros per liter. Same approach. Convert a gallon into liters, convert dollars into euros, divide them. And this is where it gets really powerful because if you have a combined unit like a speed, you can use that as a conversion. So we'll start with speed because that's one, again, that most of you understand how to do this intuitively. Like if you're traveling 65 miles per hour and you drive for three hours, how far did you go? Most of you know how to instinctively how to plug that into a calculator and get an answer. We're going to do it for a lot of things that aren't as instinctive, like densities. So it's good to practice with one where you do know what you're supposed to do. If we travel for 45 minutes at a speed of 65 miles per hour, how many feet do we travel? Well, we can take 45 minutes and convert that into hours. And then with our speed, we can convert hours into miles. And then once we're in miles, we can go to feet. Do you have a question, Sam? So, and again, you can break this up into individual steps. You can say, you know, if I was doing this in my head, I would say, well, 45 minutes, that's a three quarters of an hour. So 0.75 times my speed is how many miles I went. And then I'm going to just ballpark whatever that number is times 5,000 to get close to a number in feet. But as long as we're showing our work, and getting a real answer, we can do it all at once. 60 minutes, one hour. And this is the really obvious, but easy to, to forget on uh, when you're in a time situation, use the speed as a conversion. One hour equals 65 miles. That only works as long as you're actually going 65 miles per hour, right? So that's something that's not on your conversion sheet because it, it changes depending on your speed. And then you can say one mile is 5,280 feet. So get something like 20,000. No, that's not big enough. 200,000? Okay. <clears throat> so I slipped not one, but two decimal places. I'm just doing my math in my head. That happens. Or 2.57 times 10 to the five B. Oh, I took 40 miles and multiplied by 500, not by 5,000, that's why. Right? This is the only new step, right? The fact that we can get from a time to a distance using a speed. Any combined unit this works with, Sometimes in ways that seem counterintuitive or like, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that, but the units work out, so I'm gonna try it. Probably that's, that's fair game for this class. Um, yeah, but I don't know why I'm able to convert an area into an energy, but I'm gonna use this random conversion that says joules per square meter. Joules per square meter is a really weird unit, but it is, it is a, it's a variable called flux, energy flux. And so things like um, the density, energy density of sunlight hitting the earth is gonna be in units of, you know, joules per square meter per second. Well, I don't necessarily know what that means, but I bet I could use it like a conversion if I'm careful, right? So it allows a lot, like it, it basically removes the need to remember things like, 
velocity equals distance over time or density equals mass over volume. Because all you really need to do is make the units work out. You make the units work out, you're probably on the right track. So let's do one with density. Let's say ethanol, which is drinking alcohol, has a density of 0 0.79 grams per milliliter. How many grams are in 45 milliliters? This one's even simpler than our speed one we just did. Because I gave you density in the right units for what I'm asking, right? You don't even have to do any conversions on either side. If I have 45 milliliters, one approach is to handle this algebraically. Go find the equation for density on your equation sheet, plug in your volume, plug in your density, solve for mass. That'll give you the right answer. I don't like doing that because I find it easier to just make the units work out. So if I have 45 milliliters, I don't need to remember whether mass goes over volume or the other way around. I just need to make sure that I cancel out milliliters and I'm left in grams. So I just take the density that I'm given and say, okay, well, 0 0.79 grams equals one milliliter. Milliliters canceled milliliters and we're in grams. So there we go. How many, how many of you had a, a high school science or math class where they taught you that for things like density, there's a triangle rule or something like that? Good. I'm glad that none of you remember it because the first thing I would do would be to tell you to forget it because all it is is telling you how to make the units work out. This is easier and it's more universal. You can't mess it up and you don't need to go look up an equation to do it. And the only way it really gets more complicated is if I say, okay, you have a gallon of ethanol. How many pounds is that? but your density is in grams per milliliter. That just means you've got to take your gallon and get to milliliters. And then you can go from milliliters to grams and then from grams to pounds, right? It's still no different than what we've been doing. It's just a tool now to get from one type of variable to another. And we'll start, uh, we will do some more practice with this and we will ruin the best scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark on Monday.